Hello, Internet, and welcome to episode three of On War the Podcast. My name's Alistair, and I'm joined again by my good friend and colleague Austin. And on today's episode, we'll be looking at two broad motivations for going to war. Greed and Grievance. So, just before we get started, Austin, um, just a couple of little announcements and admin stuff. We're now officially caught up with our fortnightly release schedule, so we're going to be releasing the next episode, episode 4, in two weeks' time. And some people might be noticing that it's not Sunday night or Monday morning in Australia, uh, it's actually Wednesday, which is something else that's going to be happening. We're moving our publication date forward, because we need a little bit more breathing space as the uni semester starts up. Uh, the other thing that comes up is we've now also got our first official f- uh, patron, so shout out to uh, the username is Keith for being our first patron ever, which is kind of exciting. And of course, anyone else who's listening and wants to support us is more than welcome to. And we're going to announce a little bit of a, a, an extra bonus for the patrons. It's, it's not a big thing, but we're going to be releasing the podcast first on Patreon for our patrons, just to give them a little bit extra. So, moving on to this week's episode, and I, I guess the final announcement is that we're not actually doing this on the Not Wars. This is on something entirely different. It is. Uh, we had a bit of an offline chat about this and realized that it's probably better to go through some more of the reasoning, um, particularly when you look at greed versus grievance, which is not a common terminology. Certainly, when you know people speak about what starts wars, it always sort of boils down to, at least in your superficial conversation with a, with a colleague or a friend, it always boils down to one of these two things or a combination. So it's always going to start, I think, with this sort of stuff before we move on to your less traditional types of conflict. Yeah, because you need to know why people are actually engaging in conflict, how we're getting out there and doing it. One other thing I'd like to say here is that, a little bit of a caution, the issues we're going to be looking at today is going to, are going to be condensed and summarised for the purposes of a half-hour issue. And if you're at all interested in this, it's very well worth your time actually going and, and reading further, because these are going to be quite condensed, unfortunately. So, greed versus grievance is actually the thesis um, presented by a couple of economists, and it, it follows some broader work in economics. As such, we sort of need to determ- uh, define a, so what we mean by the mainstream of economic theory so you understand where these people are coming from. Now, in the mainstream of economic theory, the approach is pretty much today dominated by what's called neoliberalism, which is a little bit different from the liberalism we talked about last episode in international relations, which was the attitude of, of international norms the rejection of a, of a Hobbesian anarchy in the international world stage and the ideal of mutual cooperation between states. In economics, neoliberalism uh, refers to, I guess, a form of, of capitalism as a dominant way of, of trade and of functioning of economics. So some of the assumptions, I guess, of neoliberalism is that uh, human beings are, are rational, self-optimizing economic actors. That is to say that Given all of the information possible, they'll make economic choices that sort of maximize their benefit, be that resources or income and so on. The kind of flow-on assumption of this is that the society that such rational actors inhabit evolves a market on which those goods and services and so on are exchanged, and that this market is also self-optimizing. It's made up of rational actors that self-optimize themselves, and thus the evolved marketplace is self-optimizing, so much so that it's actually the most efficient division of goods and services, so long as it's left a free hand to do so. This is often called the invisible hand or the free hand of the market. And that this is sort of infinitely scalable. Uh, It applies as much to a town as a global economy. And finally, given that it's self-optimizing and infinitely scalable, that any kind of foreign interference in the market is bad. Pretty much covered it at that point? Absolutely. As an economic theory, it certainly follows those principles. Obviously, we're going to be applying it in a second, but it's worth realising that this concept of bringing economic theory into uh, what is effectively conflict studies is part of the ongoing um, creep of hard sciences into the social sciences. And we talked about this a little bit last episode, um, but it's worth acknowledging here that this theory really fits into an understanding of 
international security and international relations that is realist as well as liberalist. So your traditional approaches, it sort of falls down when you start looking at it from more non-traditional schools of international thought. Um, so that's where this comes from and that's sort of where it sits when we start to make the transition across to how it impacts and how it looks at warfare. And just on that, it's very important to realise that this is happening, that there is this push of sort of hard sciences or a desire to get hard science into these kinds of studies, particularly in conflict, because, of course, the policy makers and the powers that be want straight answers. It's been seen by many as being far too long a, a fuzzy kind of area. and they, they want formulas, they want rules they can follow. So on that, I guess a little bit of background. The greed versus grievance thesis was classically proposed by uh, two economists called Collier and Hoffler, uh, but it built on earlier work around the development of resource conflicts, predominantly around Africa and initially, you know, diamonds and anywhere you had anything that could be pulled out of the ground for profit, basically. The other thing is to realize about this idea is it's being formulated uh, in the post-Cold uh, War environment in the early to mid-90s, uh, which is a time when in conflict studies more broadly, people were moving out of the sort of ideological struggles of communism versus capitalism or West versus East that had dominated the Cold War. And so they were looking for sort of new narratives, new sort of theoretical threads to follow. And so for economists particularly, this new sort of greed versus grievance or market-driven conflict seemed like the perfect thing to follow. After all, capitalism had won. Absolutely, and it is certainly worth realising that that is the political climate that we're operating in, and particularly when we start looking at how greed influences the beginning of conflict through things like your private military contractors and, I suppose more importantly, your corruption and organised criminal groups. We are going to be talking about it from a Western state perspective and dealing with terms such as weak state, failed state, non-Westphalian state betrays a level of conventional approach that is necessary for this theory to be applied because it views these things as inherently negative. On that note, we should start moving into the first facet of this theory, which is greed. And what this is about, really, is the argument that behind conflict is the desire for a state, just like a human, in the liberalist economy, the desire of that state to acquire more resources and put itself in the best economic position it can within what well, I guess the direct international relations term would be anarchy. Yeah, or within side a state too. I mean, this theory is applied just as much, if not more, to conflicts within a state, civil wars and so on, as they are to the, the broader world stage particularly in the terms of, of resource conflicts. I've got a quote from Collier here, which sort of highlights it well, I think. And his contention was that a profound gap existed between popular perceptions of the causes of conflict and the results from recent, as in theirs, economic analysis. In that context, economic predation was the norm in conflict and that insurgents, and this is where it plays into non-state actors, are indistinguishable from bandits or pirates. And you can certainly see how that is influenced by how we currently approach your bandits or pirates or how those terms are applied in the discourse around certain conflicts, particularly at the intrastate level, as opposed to state-to-state -state conflict. Yeah, famously, at their peak, the Islamic State was certainly trafficking huge reservoirs of oil and actively recruiting engineers and, and various other specialists to aid the production of, of that resource and, and to ship it internationally. Although where exactly it's gone has become somewhat harder to track. You get the same sort of results in, in Africa's diamond wars and the various conflicts there. So the economists sort of took it a little step further, having believed they'd established that uh, the cause of conflict was more in economic kind of motivation rather than political or, or I guess, grievance, the you know, various problems that arise between ethnicities or religions. They went to sort of try and develop that theory a little bit uh, more thoroughly. So Hirschliefer is another one theorist who subscribes to this idea, presented the concept of a conflict equilibrium, where 
differing sides in a protracted conflict, or perhaps even in a fragile or weak state, or between different states quarrelling over a shared or, or marginal border resource, are presented as being part of a conflict equilibrium. Neither side is necessarily at war or at peace in that equilibrium, but are instead both rationally balancing, that is, rationally in the economic neoliberal sense, the perspective costs and benefits of taking either a productive, that is, peaceful strategy towards the resource production, or a predatory one that involves conflict. And this is particularly apparent when you have ongoing long-term civil conflicts. One of the case studies we're dealing with a little bit later is sort of Colombia, but Alistair mentioned the diamond trade, the illicit diamond trade in Africa, but also closer to home. We have in our backyard the second most pirated region in the world, and we also have some of the largest aspects of what in the West is seen as corruption, and one of our close regional neighbours relatively speaking, in East Asia, Myanmar is the second largest producer in heroin. What's interesting here, though, is particularly with ongoing civil wars, and we see this across multiple states in our region, is that an almost, tr not a truce because the conflict on go continues, but within a state where corruption is rife, where the state body is, state body is weaker, and where the rebel group or insurgent faction has strong links with either committing directly transnational crime or with organized criminal groups. What we see is a level of resource extraction that is allowed, where the state is focused on protecting itself and its own interests or is crippled from protecting its own resources against the predation of these organized criminal groups. And this is a reason why the economists are getting involved because it's important to remember that these low intensity conflicts and aren't necessarily hot wars, so to speak, they do have a major economic impact. Even if you take piracy, for example, there were over 1,600 recorded acts of piracy between 2000 and 2003 in our backyard in the Southeast Asian region. Of these, most occur from docked vessels where they demand a ransom to let the ship go, sometimes up to $100,000. And these instances can have serious economic impacts on the state, particularly when the state is weakened or is unable to protect itself or its vessels. So the 2002 attack in Yemen on a Yemeni ship led to a 300% increase on ship insurance policies for ships traveling through Yemeni ports or Yemeni waters. And that had an immediate impact on the Yemeni economy, where their port volumes, the, the amount of commercial equipment that was transitioning through their ability to tax it effectively, and here's where the kicker is, dropped by 50%. So that had a major impact on the state's ability to fix the issue involved, to stop that predation that Alistair mentioned. And this is one of the things when you're looking at, uh, particularly when you're looking at greed, the most obvious ones that we're dealing with here is when you've got a conflict that involves as one party, a transnational criminal group. So when you're l looking at piracy or when you're looking at the illegal drug trade, both of which have quite heavy conflicts in terms of the use of arms and violence, these organizations in the conflict, and I wouldn't go as f f so far as to ever call it a war when you're dealing with these kinds of groups, but one of the sort of strategies of these groups is to maintain this, this level of state instability that allows them to conduct their business. And it's not only just your overt criminal acts, your violent criminal acts like the drug trade, piracy, illegal logging, which is not what you'd immediately go to when you think of transnational crime, has an insane impact on the economies and therefore the resilience of these states. For example, it's thought that over 40% of the timber that comes out of Indonesia is illegal taken by organized criminal groups. The World Bank thinks that it rises as much as 80% of all logging in Bolivia and 42% of illegal logging of logging in Colombia. We're not talking about dudes smuggling timber on the back of a pickup truck here. We're not talking about people running drugs into the US in the backseat of their minivan. We're talking about 
an organized group that is shipping in commercial quantities, literally tons, metric tons of illicit goods that they're making a profit off of. That indicates that these states have completely lost the ability to effectively govern their own resources. These are incredibly valuable resources. Even just the timber, we're looking at billions of dollars. The illegal drug trade, billions of dollars. Human trafficking, again, billions of dollars. I think Colombia is a great example of this. Anyone who's watched Narcos on Netflix will kind of already be a little bit familiar with the drug trade in Colombia. But Colombia has actually played host to the longest running insurgency in the modern world, stemming from about 1958 and arguably still going on today, although peace processes between the major groups are currently actually in the process of being signed and they look like they might stick this time. But in that, of course, you've got uh, early days of the uh, insurgency with the uh, National Liberation Army, the ELN, and uh, and the Revolutionary Armed Forces of uh, Colombia, FARC, as the classic sort of left-wing nationalist revolutionary groups. But by the time of, you know, Narcos and your Pablo Escobar and the Medellin cartel and, and other cartels get involved in the drug trade, and the nature of the conflict starts to change because all of this money, these um, resources, start to flow in. Now, when the Medellin cartel and the other cartels became, uh, started to get stomped uh, by the Colombian government in actions that were quite militaristic, uh, that trade didn't go away. Uh, to give you a comparison, uh, 1978, the DEA estimated that about 85% of a four U, uh, billion dollar a year, that's US billion dollar a year cocaine trade came from Colombia. By 2005, the estimated figure of FARC's cocaine trade alone was 3.5 billion. So the numbers really didn't change. And those resources, instead of going to criminal gangs, which of course like the high lives and really are purely in it for the money, was going instead to sustain an ongoing insurgency. Now, whether or not that insurgency had become more like a cartel than a true nationalist revolution is a different argument for a different episode. But it shows how that, how much that funding can, can be and how long it can sustain uh, that kind of ongoing conflict. I mean, FARC has been operating in Colombia since 1958. Not only that, to, but to bring it back to your point about between, uh, with other countries, Colombia has been in constant disagreement, if not veiled conflict with its neighbours due to the passage of cocaine across state borders. So that sort of really shows a, a, the perfect case study of that transnational criminal element that becomes quite rife when you're dealing with this pure greed kind of thesis. Now there was another example of pure greed and conflict that you were dying to talk about, Austin, I know, uh, in the the mercenary aspect. Uh, you're right there, Alistair. I mean, we, we used to have, when we were first putting together the show notes for this, the military-industrial complex, but that's been pushed to another episode because, as we all know, um, that is a can of worms that we really need to open and kill all the worms. So we will limit it just to mercenaries here because, again, what we're seeing here is an enabler, a non-state entity that, for reasons of greed, enables or prolongs conflict in the same way as transnational criminal groups do. For the same reason. Now, your mercenary, or to use the term they prefer at the moment, private military contractor, allows a state that would otherwise not have the resources to persecute a conflict or the political capital to do so. It allows them to have access to that option, that foreign policy option being warfare. What that translates to is a group of of trained soldiers who you don't have to use resources to train, house, equip, etc., who will go in and persecute conflict, their only reason being to personally improve their economic standing. The reason that mercenaries are important, I think, to talk about with greed is that they're the only organisation where the vast majority of their participation in a conflict, no matter how ongoing the conflict, is driven by greed as opposed to grievance. And my personal opinion on grievous grievance will come in a little bit later, but I think it's important to raise here that mercenaries have the ability to be sent in and then pulled out when the money stops flowing. And while there are plenty of examples through history and even modern times of that not exactly going to plan, the recent, historically recent, 
fall of things like apartheid has meant that we have a plethora of these soldiers, and particularly the war on terror has produced tons of them, soldiers who are willing to fight for greed, effectively, for economic security. And that has meant that states are more willing and more able to persecute wars on the basis of predatory economic goals. One of the things that pops up in the literature about the, the rise of the private military corporation too, though, is a look at how large corporations in general tend to function in the U.S. political scheme. And one of the concerns that gets raised by authors again and again is um, the possibility that such corporations, given sufficient growth, uh, might come to directly impact foreign policy through their contributions to political campaigns or so on. Particularly when you're dealing with the United States and the president can't declare a war without congressional approval, but perhaps inside of the discretionary funding they can afford a few security advisors. Uh, you saw that in Iraq uh, when President Obama was able to deploy, oh, I, I can't remember the number, but several thousand security advisors in excess of what Congress had allowed in the deployment of troops because it was part of a different budget stream and a different political process. And when that starts to affect things, there are more questions you have to ask. Although, again, this is not a, a new thing. I mean, you can look at um, Roman uh, the, the Roman use of mercenaries in the 3rd and 2nd um, century BCs onwards throughout the empire, the actions of the Condottori in the Italian, um, in the Renaissance, in Italy in the Renaissance. I mean, this isn't, none of this is new. Nothing that we really talk about in this podcast winds up being new. Absolutely. And, and also the economic impact of simply having the level of, and I don't want to get into the military industrial complex thing here, but I will mention it briefly. The level of economic value of these companies, particularly in the post 9-11 era, has meant that they do have significant political pull within the US, but also within the developing countries in which they typically operate. G4S, for example, the British private security firm, is the third largest employer on the planet. And let that sink in a little while at home. The third largest employer of human beings on our planet is in private security. It is a PMC, a private military company. Not that all those people are mercenaries, of course. You'll have accountants and lawyers and public relations people and all sorts in that. But the fact that it's gone sort of beyond the the, the romantic 1950s, 1960s image of the, the adventuring soldier of fortune to such a large corporation invested in so many different things kind of shows you the scale of this. So we've sort of dealt with two very clear examples where greed is absolutely a primary motivator in conflict. That is, transnational criminal groups and organized crime and, and of course, the, the mercenary factor with private military companies. But this theory isn't without its problems. And I guess the first one that I want to bring up is the cornerstone of all of this and of that neoliberalist economic theory is this idea that human beings are rational actors. Uh, no space is given to beliefs or in inequalities beyond resource distribution or prejudices. And when they do that, what they really do is they remove the context to many conflicts, and they ultimately sort of desocialize and dehumanize what I would say is probably the most intrinsically human and social act that is of violence, particularly organized and resistive violence. When we start looking at this stuff, and particularly because when you start looking at ongoing conflicts, where this falls down is... There is no way for an actor to remain rational, particularly, and we've, we've talked about obviously mercenaries and transnational crime groups. They might start a conflict or they might join a conflict, I suppose is the better terminology, on the basis purely of greed. But once bullets start flying and people start feeling fear, the fear, the hatred, the stress of being in a combat zone, it's no longer a purely rational decision-making process that occurs. And we have to remember, and this is what these sort of theories miss when you don't take into account the social, states are at the end of the day, and particularly states' military campaigns at the end of the day are conducted by, comprised of, and influenced by human beings, individual human beings with their own flaws and their own irrationalities that aren't taken into account by this simple dichotomy they have here. Yeah, and you, you see this everywhere you look. In organized crime, it might take the form of a, a revenge killing or 
someone taking advantage of a situation to uh, take on a personal vendetta, which of course is the topic of many criminal investigations and action movies alike. But on the other side of things, you can have conflict spiral completely out of control through a pure act of grievance. So an example I want to use here, and I will probably bring this up again in later episodes, was in Iraq in 2006, when a group of militants from what was then Al-Qaeda in Iraq snuck into the Askaria Shrine, which is one of the most holy sites in Shia Islam, kidnapped the guards and blew the damn thing up. Now, what then followed from that was a rapid disintegration into civil war. Now, this wasn't the only trigger point, but is perhaps one of the more important ones. Um, several people have called this the most deadly terrorist attack that killed no one. The actual bombs themselves, like I said, they removed the guards and no one was hurt. But it led to hundreds of thousands of Iraqi people displaced internally and many more externally, as well as a civil war that proved impossible to contain over the next 14 months, and arguably the current conflict is partially an extension of it. What you end up getting is this channeling of that grievance, which becomes a fulcrum, becomes the point of the spear behind which all other grievances are compressed. And eventually what happens is it sparks violence for no real economic gain. But your economic pressures create that that fault line which then allows this very human very human feeling and fears to push us to irrational violence and i think both greed and grievance must be considered in com combination if this theory is to be useful at all yeah, and this is what the economists often miss. Uh, they're very single-minded in their approach, and when you see greed or greed and grievance being used, it's particularly problematic in that, at the end of the day, this the greed factor seems to trump everything. And the temptation here really is that when you start seeing greed factors, particularly if you're in that of that mindset in economics or just simply wanting a, a simpler formulaic answer to conflict, it's very easy to start saying, oh, well, the real reason they did it was for cocaine money or for oil or for whatever the resource happens to be. And these things are never that simple. If you don't look at the whole picture, then you're missing the point. And particularly because it's the decision not to kill each other that forms society. And warfare really is the breakdown of that fundamental understanding between human beings. And that is an intensely personal, intensely psychological, and intensely sociological event that simply cannot be captured by economics. And any one of these organizations we've spoken of, any one of them would quite happily transition across to another form of income in order to sustain their grievance-based conflict any one of these rebel groups. If there was something they could do, they had access to that would provide the same level of resources in the same manner for no extra cost, they would do it. They're not generally attached to the point where they would give up their cause, give up their grievance in order to satisfy an economic need in one way or another. And this is when you start to distinguish what is the action of organized crime and what could be called a war, or at the very least a, a political conflict is that organized crime is engaging in conflictual actions to support an income stream, drugs, illegal logging, whatever. Whereas in a war, in an insurgency, in a conflict, illegal income streams are used to fuel and supplement a grievance and to pursue that conflict for that conflict's own goals rather than simply to make money. And on that, we've unfortunately run out of time. Thanks again for joining us in our discussions on war and conflict. If you've enjoyed the show and would like to support us directly, please consider visiting our Patreon page. The support of our patrons goes a long way to improving the quality of the show and gives you a chance to catch the episodes early as well as give your opinion on surveys and even join live streams where you can ask your own questions and engage in the discussions directly. Of course, 
As always, the best and simplest way you can support us is to simply share this podcast with any friends, students, or colleagues you think might enjoy it, and by sending us your feedback. If you would like some further reading on today's topics and case studies, or would like to send us your thoughts, please visit our blog at www.onwarthepodcast.wordpress.com or follow the links in the description below. Join us in two weeks' time as we resume our regular schedule to explore peacekeeping, police actions, and other not-wars that nevertheless constitute political violence in the modern world. Once again, thank you for listening, and good night.